Where would Christmas be without the Christmassy beverages for toasting the season and sharing a cup of good cheer? Along with foods like gingerbread and panettone, drinks like hot chocolate and mulled cider help to make the season uniquely flavorful and festive. But the most Christmassy beverage of all just may be that sweet, golden, creamy concoction served with a sprinkling of nutmeg and a cinnamon stick for stirring in the rum or brandy. We've been drinking some version of eggnog since medieval times. Even though it wasn't always called eggnog, and even though the eggnog we drink today bears little to no resemblance to its forebears. But few things are as quintessentially Christmassy as the taste of eggnog. And I'm perfectly fine with the version we have now. I'm not sure I'd want to try any of the older versions, honestly. But where did eggnog come from? How did taxes and trade help shape the modern drink? And what does the word nog mean anyway? Come with me on a tasty and boozy trip back in time. I'm Brian Earle. This is Christmas Past. Here are two things we know to be true. Number one, as far back as the late 17th century in England, there was a strong beer known as nog. And number two, going back hundreds of years earlier than that in England, certain alcoholic drinks were served in small carved wooden mugs called noggins. Now, here's the part we don't know. We don't know whether the word eggnog is in reference to number one or number two. There's even a third option. According to at least one historian, the word eggnog is a combination of egg and grog, which was a slang term for the rum that was often added to the drink. The point is that there's some debate over the true origins of the term. And the drink has gone by other names, like milk punch and egg milk punch, which just doesn't have the same ring to it. But it's certain that by the late 18th century, the word eggnog was being used here in America. It appeared in print for the first time in 1788. No matter where the term came from, most culinary historians will tell you that eggnog is based on a medieval British drink called posset, made from hot milk curdled with alcohol, either wine or ale, and flavored with spices. It was often used as a cold or flu remedy. Variations involved ingredients like fresh cream, eggs, and different spices. These were usually available only to the wealthy, and as such, it was often used when making toasts to prosperity. For most of its life, posset wasn't associated exclusively with Christmas. It wasn't until it crossed the Atlantic and arrived in the colonies here in America that it not only became known as eggnog officially, but also became a Christmas tradition. And the addition of rum as the alcohol is another American contribution, and not necessarily because colonists preferred the taste of rum. During its time in England, it was usually spiked with ale or brandy. In the colonies, brandy was very heavily taxed. And thanks to a bustling trade with the Caribbean, rum was comparatively cheaper and more plentiful. But of course, you can spike it with almost anything. Whiskey is also common, or at least it was, and in 1826, a plan to add whiskey to eggnog went horribly awry. Cadets at West Point had been informed that their Christmas eggnog would be alcohol-free, because drinking on campus had gotten out of hand and alcohol was now prohibited. But a group of cadets hatched a mischievous plan to remedy the situation. They took a boat across the Hudson to procure two gallons of whiskey and smuggle it back into the barracks. On Christmas Eve, a group of cadets started pouring the spiked eggnog in one of their quarters. Word quickly spread, and the party grew larger and louder and drunker and rowdier, and it went on into the wee hours and then the following morning, before order could be restored. The whole incident went down in history as the Eggnog Riot, sometimes also called the Grog Mutiny, but I like Eggnog Riot better, and it resulted in 20 cadets getting court-martialed. Maybe that's one argument against drinking the stuff spiked. Personally, I've never enjoyed the flavor of any kind of alcohol in eggnog. But it's also true that the eggnog I've had all of my life has been the store-bought kind where everything has been pasteurized. Back in the days before pasteurization and refrigeration, the addition of alcohol played an important part in making eggnog safe to drink. It never would have made it to present day if the people who invented it all got sick from food poisoning. 
Even though I'm fine with the store-bought kind, there are some people who want to try to make their own out of fresh ingredients, in which case you'll probably want the help of a guy like this. Yeah, I had been uh, making eggnog for many years. That's Jeffrey Morgenthaler. He's the author of The Bar Book, and he's also the bar manager at Clyde Common in Portland, Oregon. I asked him how a craft bartender like him approaches this holiday classic. You just blend up a couple of eggs, a little bit of sugar. Uh, you don't use any ice, you just use the blender to mix it. On low speed, add your alcohol and then your, your milk and your cream, and it's, that's it. I mean, it really takes like a couple of minutes to make a batch of eggnog. Our eggnog at Clyde Common is Añejo tequila, a Montiato sherry with cream, milk, eggs, sugar, and nutmeg. So we do things uh, slightly different. We like to, you know, kind of have a little bit of fun with it. And I've always loved tequila and sherry together. Uh, Añejo tequila is, is really essentially an aged agave brandy. So that made a lot of sense to me. And Montiato sherry brings like a nice kind of nuttiness to it. It's, it's a really beautiful drink. We serve it in teacups, you know, which is sort of a five to six ounce serving because, I mean, that's a, it's a really filling drink. You don't want to have too much of that. Uh, one or two, and I'm usually pretty good. Even though I prefer mine unspiked, I have to admit that does sound like it could be pretty tasty. Jeffrey was kind enough to let me share his signature eggnog recipe with all of you. So check the show notes for this episode at christmaspasspodcast.com and you'll find a link to Jeffrey's website. If you do try it out, let me know what you thought of it. Now, one of the best ways to enjoy eggnog is while watching a good Christmas movie. With so many Christmas movies out there, sometimes it's hard to tell which ones deserve a place on your watch list. Well, the folks from Tis the Podcast are here to help. Anthony, Julia, and Tom team up every week to rate and review Christmas movies new and old. And unlike with yours truly, Tis the Podcast releases a new weekly show all throughout the year. So what do these guys have to say about their all-time favorites? I'm Anthony. I'm Julia. And I'm Tom. And we're the co-hosts for Tis the Podcast. We just want to give you a taste of our favorite Christmas movie memory. Anthony. So my favorite Christmas movie is Tim Allen's The Santa Claus. And I remember the first time I saw this as a child. It was when I first opened in theaters. My parents took me and my sister and I just remember being completely enthralled by what I was seeing on the big screen and seeing basically the origin of Santa Claus and how a man who hated Christmas became the man who loves Christmas the most and brings joy to millions upon millions of people around the world each and every year. And that movie is so magical to me. And the message of that movie is so magical. Seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. I watch it a million times every year during the Christmas season and multiple times throughout the rest of the year. That's awesome, Anthony. How about you, Julia? Uh, my favorite Christmas movie is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation because I cannot tell a dysfunctional family story, no, especially a Christmas one. I love the family dynamic where they love each other, but they don't always get along. And it always makes me laugh, whether it's Christmas time or any other time of the year. That's my favorite. How about you, Tom? My favorite Christmas movie is Rudolph. Rudolph shares a birthday with my mom. So growing up, my mom had a strong affinity for Rudolph, and we watched it every year. Her house is almost a shrine to Rudolph this time of year. It just gives me all those warm, fuzzy feelings I had as a kid. I love Rudolph. So tune in every Monday to hear more of what we think about Christmas movies. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and Google Play. Thanks, guys. Bye, buddy. Hope you find your dad. You can check out Tis the Podcast wherever you get your podcasts and also at tisthepodcast.com. And if you check out their episode on Rudolph, you may hear a familiar voice because I had the great privilege to be invited on as a guest to discuss one of my all-time favorites. So now it's your turn. What's your favorite Christmas movie? How do you make your eggnog? How's your Christmas season going so far? I really want to hear about it, and everyone else would too. So record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspasspodcast at gmail.com. Don't be shy. And now I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball. That's because Christmas Past has been releasing episodes on Mondays and Thursdays all throughout the season. But this week is different. The next episode is going to arrive on Wednesday, and there's a good reason for that. 
I needed to make extra room in the production schedule to allow for yet another bonus episode. That's going to arrive on Friday. And of course, I'll be back again on Christmas Eve, just like last year, to wish you a Merry Christmas, to review the 2017 Christmas season, and do a little year-end wrap-up for the podcast. Now, if you don't want to miss anything, make sure you're subscribed. It's never too late. And you'll definitely want to check back on Wednesday, not only for more details about that bonus episode, but because that's the episode where I have a special celebrity guest. You'll really want to check that one out. Now, let me tell you that Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California by yours truly, Brian Earle. I'd like to thank Jeffrey Morgenthaler and the folks from Tis the Podcast. And of course, I'd like to thank you for listening. Search for Christmas Past Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to follow along and find more information about the show, including that eggnog recipe at christmaspastpodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe wherever and however you get your podcasts. And if you have a moment to leave a review on iTunes, I would really appreciate that. It helps the show a lot, more than you might think. Your reviews make the show more visible to people looking to discover Christmas podcasts. So think of it as your way of helping to spread some Christmas cheer. Well, this season of Christmas Past is starting to wind down. We have just a couple episodes left. Thank you for coming along with me so far, and I look forward to joining you again next time for another story from Christmas Past.